Homework over the weekend was page 523, number 6 to 10. Any issues besides number 9, which I know right now we're going to have to go over just based on what I saw a few minutes ago when I took a peek at your homework. Yep, 6. I got 6 and 9. Any others? Going once, going twice. Okay, 6 and 9 it is. Number 6. Describe how you could charge a glass sphere positively using the following methods. By friction, by conduction, and by induction. How could you charge a glass sphere positively using the following methods? Well, let's do conduction and induction first. Okay, they're they're probably a little bit easier. Um, does anybody have an answer for me for that one? How could you charge an object positively by conduction? Oh, sorry, by uh, yeah, by conduction or by contact, right? Remember that we said sometimes charging by contact we just refer to as conduction, even though it's really a subcategory of conduction. We talked about a couple examples on Friday, right? A couple of uh, applications of charging objects on Friday. One was that electrostatic painting gun, right? And the other one was that electrostatic precipitate, that air cleaner. Remember both cases, um, whether it was the neutral dust particles or whether it was the neutral paint particles, they went by a charged object. As they went by and touched that charged object, what happened to them? Those neutral paint particles, those neutral dust particles, as they touched that charged object, they tried to balance out the charge, right? So if the, the object that they touched was negative, then the dust particles became negative. If the object that they touched was positive, then they would have became positive. Right? Neutral touches positive, they bec the neutral becomes positive. So if you want to touch, so if you want to charge a, a sphere positive by conduction, touch the neutral sphere to something that is already positive, and they're going to try to balance out the charge. Same size, same shape, same material, then they probably will balance out the, the charge. If they're not quite the same size or shape or material, then they might not balance out, but the bottom line is they're both still going to be positive. Maybe one more than the other, but it's still going to be positive. What about induction? We'll assume that they mean permanently charged by induction here. You want to charge it positively by induction? Remember, we have that neutral object. Um, what are we going to bring nearby it? We're going to bring a charged object nearby it. Is it going to be negative or is it going to be positive? I'll tell you what, if you're anything like me, you forget these things. Listen, that's okay if you forget these things. In a way, it's almost good if you forget whether you bring a positive charged rod or a negative charged rod nearby. Because I don't want you to have these things memorized. I want you to understand and be able to think through these things. Okay? So we know that we're going to attach a ground wire. If we want to make this positive, what do we got to do? Do we got to take in more electrons or do we got to give off electrons to the ground? We bring them up or send them down? Send them down. So if you send down electrons, there's only one way that you can accomplish that, right? Send down these electrons. What kind of object does this need to be in order to send down those electrons, negative or positive? Negative. So if you want to charge something negative, sorry, positive by induction, you've got to bring a negatively charged rod nearby. Now, honestly, I've done this enough times that I remember that you got to bring a negatively charged rod nearby. I remembered the answer to that question when I saw it without working through it like that. But if I was in your position, seeing a question like this for the first time in homework, I guarantee you I wouldn't have remembered that. I guarantee I wouldn't have remembered that. If you can remember that, you've got a better memory than I do, that's for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't have remembered that. Hey, honestly, I could have seen this 10 times and probably not remembered that you got to bring a negatively charged rod nearby to make it positive. But that's okay. I'm okay with that because I can figure it out every single time using the reasoning that I just used. And really, in the end, if you remember it, that's great. Okay, but I want you to be able to figure it out as well, just in case you do forget it. Simon? Well, not necessarily, but if you want to charge it positively right, by induction, it, if there's not a ground wire attached, the best you can do is induce a temporary separation of charge, right? So you're not really charging it positive in that case. You can charge one side positive. I just made the assumption in this question that, it, that they meant permanently charge it by induction, because otherwise it would really the object is still neutral if it's if there's no ground wire attached, right? All right, charging by friction. Now, 
without using, without having a copy of the electrostatic series, remember I talked about that briefly on Thursday or Friday? The electrostatic series is that ranking of different materials to how well they gain electrons and how well they give up electrons. Okay, some materials will gain electrons really, really easily, accept electrons really, really easily, Maria. Some, some uh, materials won't. Some materials give off electrons a lot easier than others. Okay, I don't have that memorized, nor do I expect you to have that memorized. If you've downloaded the paragraph form notes that I have up on our website, okay, then there's a copy of that electrostatic series in there. There's also a copy in your textbook. But you don't have to know that electrostatic series. Basically, if you had a copy of that in front of you, you could say, look, well, I'll rub the positively charged the, the positively charged glass sphere against something that will that will that will uh, accept electrons. In other words, you want the glass to give up electrons to this other material. You'd pick a material from that series that would accept electrons really, really well. Okay. I don't know what that material is off the top of my head, nor do you most likely know what it is off the top of your head. That's okay. Basically, we're going to just answer this by saying we're going to rub the glass sphere. Okay, rub the glass sphere, charging by friction, right, against something that will accept electrons easily. Therefore, the glass sphere will give up electrons and become positively charged as it loses those electrons. Yep? Uh, well, be careful with that. You could be right on that. That's, that's actually not bad thinking there. Uh, rub against something that's uh, that's that's more positive. Um, you got to be careful with that. That could work, but not necessarily. Let's assume that the glass sphere, okay, the glass is going to be red. It's neutral. Okay, you rub that against something that's positive. You got a couple negatives in there. You got a lot of positives in there, right? You rub those two things together, um, and most likely, okay, as, as soon as they touch, you're going to get charging by contact, right? So most likely, they would both end up positively charged. Okay, but the problem is this. What if you had a situation like this um, where the glass uh, object was, was negatively charged right now? Okay, so uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And if you're just assuming kind of charging by contact there, right, they touch each other, and then, then they try to balance each other out, then it's still going to be negatively charged, right? So you've got to be, got to be careful with that one. It's more not so much what the charge of this material is, but rather what type of material it is when you're charging by friction. Okay. And the other one was number nine that we had to go over. Oh, good question. Good question. Compare the distribution of charge so distribution just means kind of where the charges are, right? The, the spread out of the charge. On a hanging aluminum and glass rods, if they're both touched at one end by a negatively charged ebonite rod. Ebonite, by the way, is just a material that's like kind of a rubbery, plasticky material. What's the distribution of charge on a hanging aluminum and glass rod? Here's the aluminum rod. Actually, don't they call it aluminium now? Chemistry people? Isn't it aluminium now, not aluminum? Isn't there an IU? Um, yeah, it's spelled that way. Yeah, yeah isn't it? it is. Who takes chemistry here? Haven't you guys learned that it isn't, isn't it called aluminium now? Yes? Okay, so some of you. Some of you are paying attention to chemistry class, obviously. So here's the aluminium uh, rod. Uh, it's touched at one end by a negatively charged ebonite rod. So let's bring uh, the negatively charged ebonite rod nearby. The aluminium, let's assume, is neutral with equal number of positives and negatives. What's going to happen to the positives in there? Nothing. What's going to happen to the negatives? They're going to get pushed to the left-hand side, right? So you're going to get uh, a whole bunch of negatives on the left-hand side and pauses more on the right-hand side. You're going to get this temporary uh, separation of charge there. Uh, 
well, hold on, actually. It's touched at one end by a uh, negatively charged ebonite rod. Hmm. Ebonite would be a, a kind of a plasticky, rubbery non-conductor. A non-conductor. So you might get some of these electrons jumping over here. But if ebonite is a non-conductor, you're not going to get a huge number of them going over there, right? So in other words, you're going to get a preponderance of the electrons over here on the left-hand side, and you're going to have on the right-hand side less negatives than you have on the left-hand side. Okay, does that make sense? Aluminum is a conductor. The electrons are going to move freely around that conductor because that's how we define a conductor, right? The electrons are free to move around wherever they want pretty much. But the ebonite is an insulator, so you're not going to get a whole lot of electrons going from the insulator to the conductor. Now, if we look at it as a glass rod instead of an ebonite rod, so that's a glass rod this time. Here's my uh, negatively charged ebonite rod. What's going to happen this time? What's going to happen to the positives? Nothing. What's going to happen to the negatives? Well, if it's a non-conductor, what do you think is going to happen to these negatives? You might get some of them going a little bit to the left, like a shift to the left. Is it going to be as dramatic as it is in the conductor? No, because the electrons aren't as free to move about. So um, exactly how much is it going to shift to the left? Well, we're not sure exactly, but not nearly as much as it did in the first diagram where the, uh, the rod was a conductor, the aluminum. Does that make sense? Uh, after a small negatively charged metal sphere momentarily touches a larger neutral metal sphere. Well, they're both conductors here. After a small negatively charged metal sphere, okay, here's my negatively charged metal sphere, and here's my larger neutral metal sphere. What's going to happen? They touch each other. The electrons are going to go from the, neg the negative to the one that's neutral, making them both negative. Are they going to be equal negative? Probably not. The one that's larger will probably have a larger negative charge. Does that make sense? Because it's able to hold more extra charge. Right? We talked about that um, last week again. If we have equal size, equal shape, same material, then the charges are probably going to balance out. But if we have something that's bigger, it's able to hold more charge than something that's smaller. So the reality is they both become negatively charged every single time, but the one that's, but the one that's bigger will probably hold more charge than the one that's smaller, depending upon the shape. Okay. Does that answer question number nine for us? Did anybody have for question number nine more or less the answers that we just gave you? Yes, good. Excellent. Any other questions there? Yeah. Ten? Yeah. A negatively charged uh, ebonite rod is something of the, the knob of a neutral electroscope. Okay, we talked about that electroscope on Friday as well. Explain what happens to the leaves of the electroscope. Uh, so let's draw it out here. Here's my neutral electroscope. Okay. Um, doesn't matter what it's in, whether it's in the Erlenmeyer flask, which is the second diagram that I showed you on Friday, or whether it was just in that cylindrical uh, container or a square container, or whatever, doesn't really matter. Uh, it's neutral, so it's got positives everywhere, but it's also got negatives everywhere, making it neutral everywhere. We're going to bring the negatively charged ebonite rod nearby. What's going to happen to the leaves of the electroscope? Well, what happens to the positives in the electroscope? Everything in the electroscope is a conductor, right? So what's going to happen to those positives? Stay where they are. What's going to happen to the negatives? Negatives get, negatives get pushed away from the negatively charged ebonite rod. So now we have the negatives all going down. Not all of them, but lots of them going down into the leaves, leaving this leaf, leaf negative, this leaf negative. They're going to repel each other. And they're going to push each other apart. Yeah, Simon? Why, Why wouldn't the positives go towards the top? 
because the positive is as long as we have a solid here, right, and are, and are part of an atom, the atoms themselves aren't going to move around within the solid, and the protons within the atoms of the solid aren't going to move around because they're too tightly bound to the nucleus. I remember on the first day we talked about the electric force that keeps the electrons in orbit around the nucleus. It's a strong enough force, but it can be overcome. But then within the nucleus, there's protons in there that are pulled together by what we call the strong nuclear force. And that's a much stronger force at that short distance. So these guys, they don't want to spread apart. This guy, it doesn't really want to spread apart, but it's a lot easier to get it moving, to get it moving out than it is these two guys. If these two guys split apart, then you don't have, you're not worrying about getting electrocuted then. Yeah, then you're worrying about a nuclear reaction then, right? Which it is conceivable to have protons leaving, but not because of this. It has to be because of other reasons that we'll talk about in our last unit. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. No, uh, I'd, I'd be very surprised if you saw a question like that. I mean, understand that you know, if you have something where the atom can move or the, uh, the, the charged object can move, then it is conceivable to have positives moving. Okay, but um, I'd be very surprised. Okay. Um, maybe on a more macroscopic scale, like you know, like you got a positively charged balloon, and you bring something positive nearby it. What's going to happen to the positively charged balloon? The, the balloon will be pushed away, right? Even though it's positive, the positive will be pushed away, but not the individual atoms within that balloon, but rather the object itself, because it's floating in this air, right? And, and the object is free to move. So if the positives within the substance are free to move, like in a gas or liquid, then conceivable, right? But probably wouldn't see a question like that. No. Yeah. Well, what would happen if you put a positive bar there? OK. Well, then we'll take a look at question B on, after that. If we put a positive bar there, the positives stay where they are. But the negatives this time, the positives stay where they are. But the negatives all get pulled up into here. So that still leaves us with like charges on the leaves of the electroscope. They still spread apart. It's just the opposite charge to which they were when I brought the negative nearby. Does that make sense? OK, what does B say? We'll explain what happens to the leaves of the electroscope if the other side of the knob is now grounded while the rod is still in place. We talked about this on Friday, right? Let's go back to our original question here, though. Here's my neutral electroscope. Uh, the negatively charged object was, was brought nearby, which pushed the negatives all down into the leaves of the electroscope. They spread apart. What's going to happen if I ground it over here? Anybody take a stab at that? The leaves spread apart before I grounded it. The leaves are going to spread apart after I ground it as well. But not because the leaves are negatively charged. Rather, those negatives aren't going to be pushed down there. Those negatives are going to be pushed down there. So the leaves are still like charges and still repel, but this time they're positive charged instead of negatively charged. Okay. Explain why removing the ground wire first, then the rod will leave a net charge on the electroscope. So if I cut that ground wire before I take away this one, remember, this is the guy shows up at the party. Everybody's having a good time at the party. This guy shows up and, and kind of smells of it. Nobody really wants to be around him. So what happens? Everybody leaves the party, right? All the negatives leave the party because they don't want to be around him. And somebody cuts the ground wire. Somebody cuts the path back to the house, where the party is. What happens to those negatives? they got to stay down on the ground, right? Even after this guy leaves, the smelly guy leaves, these guys want to go back to the party. The negatives want to go back in there. But the sidewalk is torn up, so they can't go back. They're stuck down on the ground. So what's it look like after you remove the ground wire, before you take away the charging object? Well. 
the leaves remain permanently positively charged. Somebody in the other class said, well, does permanent mean permanent? Not necessarily, because charges can discharge to or from the air. So eventually, the leaves of the electroscope would probably come back down, eventually. When we say permanent, we mean, like, you know, more than a few seconds kind of thing. Okay. Devin, does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good question to ask here, number 10 was. Good. All right, guys, if I can have you take a peek at multiple choice number 36 now in your uh, worksheet booklet, multiple choice number 36. And if you could submit this one, please, as multiple choice one, that'd be wonderful. Give you about uh, one minute to do this one, please. All right, guys, take a look at this. Overwhelmingly, people said D. Let's hope that's correct. Because uh, 80 something percent of you said. Uh, the answer is D. A uh, student places a positively charged sphere near a metal rod. Uh, both, uh, both are on insulated stands and the rod is grounded. So in other words, they're on insulated stands, meaning that you're not going to get any charge loss or gain from the ground to the object through here, right? Okay, through the stand that it's on. Uh, you see that this is, this is grounded. So what's going to happen here? This positively charged rod, what's it do to the positives in there? Nothing. What's it do to the negatives in there? Pulls them over to the left-hand side. What else does it do? It pulls negative from the ground up in there as well. So in the end, what's going to happen? We're going to get uh, a whole bunch of electrons coming up from the ground, and we're going to end up with uh, a, a rod XY that is negatively charged at end X. Uh, because, in fact, it's going to be negatively charged at end X, it's probably going to be somewhat negatively charged at end Y as well because of the extra electrons going up in there. In the end, the whole thing is going to be negatively charged. But the one that matches up with, uh, uh, with what we've seen here is D, negative at end X, because the electrons are moving onto the rod from the ground. Good. Yeah, the other options that we had here that people picked were A and B. Um, Assuming the electrons moved off the rod into the ground, right? The electrons are going to be attracted to this big positively charged ball right there. Okay. Um, next thing I want to do, guys, is uh, shift gears a tiny little bit, still with electricity, but talk about um, the first thing that's going to eventually, uh, later on today or tomorrow, lead us to the first mathematical thing besides averaging things together, the first mathematical concept in this unit. It's called Coulomb's torsion balance experiment, which leads us to something called Coulomb's law in a little bit. Uh, a guy named Charles Augustine de Coulomb performed an experiment to determine the relationship between electric force and the amount of charge that you have and the distance that separates the charges that you have. Okay, we knew, we know and we knew that if you have charges that are the same, then they're going to repel each other. Opposite charges will attract each other. Well, by how much? What's the value of that force? How strong is that force when these charges come close enough together to affect each other? So Coulomb performs this experiment that looks something like this. What I'm about to show you is a bit of a simplification, but it's good enough. It does allow us to find, again, that relationship between all of those things that affect the force. This is representing a ceiling, a string hanging from the ceiling, a rod, pretty light rod, with an object at either end. So that this rod and the objects at both ends that are hanging on the string ends up being balanced, you're probably going to want both of those objects to be the same mass, although that's not critical for our understanding of this. We're going to charge one of them. We're going to call it Q1. Now, you could charge the other one if you want, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, that's not really relevant to the experiment. We're going to charge one of them, and we're going to call it Q1. We're going to bring another charge, one that you don't see yet on the board, nearby Q1. That's going to be represented by my fist here. Okay, my fist is going to be Q2. As I bring Q2 nearby Q1, what happens? 
So Q2 gets near Q1. What's going to happen to Q1? Well, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, right? Because we don't know what the charges are, positive or negative or positive and positive. We don't know. But we do know there's going to be a force of either attraction or repulsion. And that's going to cause this whole system that you see up on the board there to either to twist. It's going to either twist clockwise or counterclockwise. Q1 either comes out towards my fist here or Q1 goes away from my fist, depending upon what the charges are, right? It twists. Well, that doesn't show us anything. It just shows us that charges will attract each other, repel each other, which everybody already knew. So how does that help us to determine what the actual relationship is, the mathematical relationship between the amount of charge that you have and the distance that separates it? Well, Kuhn would perform a number of experiments here. The first experiment would involve manipulating, okay, manipulating Q1. The responding variable in that case would be the force, and the control variables would be Q2 and the distance. We're going to call the distance R. Remember, Q is the amount of charge you have, F would be force, of course, and R is the distance that separates them. So in the first experiment, he would bring Q2 nearby Q1. He would change the value of Q1 for each trial you have, he would see how that affected the force, all the while keeping the distance between them constant and the value of Q2 constant. He gets some data, plots a graph. Q1 goes on the x-axis because the manipulated variable is always on the x-axis. F would go on the y-axis because the responding variable is always on the y-axis. He would have got a graph that looked like this. A nice, perfect, well, close to perfect straight line, which told him that F, the magnitude of the force, the absolute value of the force, the magnitude of the force, whether it was attractive or repulsive, was directly related to Q1. In other words, as Q1 increased, the magnitude of the force increased linearly. If Q1 doubled, F would double. If Q2 Quadrupled, F would quadruple. It's a linear relationship. And then he performs another experiment. This time, he changes the value of Q2. The responding variable in that case, the one that would change because he changed the value of Q2, would still be the force. Tell me what the control variables in this case would be. What would have to stay the same in this case? Simon? Q1, yes, and what else? Good. Q1 and the distance that separates them. Good. So now he's going to plot a graph of Q2 versus, uh, sorry, F versus Q2. And similarly, he gets a straight line. That tells him that the magnitude of the force is directly related to Q2. So as Q1 doubles, F will double. As Q2 triples, F will triple. They're both linear relationships. Now, by the way, just as a question there, Daniel? Uh, Q1 and R. So the control variables, C stands for control variables there, would be Q1 and then the distance that separates them. Now, a little aside here, guys, that... Uh, it's not a huge deal for us, but the reality is Coulomb didn't have a way of directly measuring charge. We now measure charge in Coulombs. Coulomb didn't have a way of measuring the actual value of the charge. So how could he manipulate the value of the charge without really knowing what the charge was? Well, let's say that Q1 starts off charged. We don't know what it is, but it starts off charged. If you touch Q1 to something that's neutral, then Q1 becomes half of what it was, right? Because they balance out. So you just change the value of Q1 to a half Q1. Touch it against something that's neutral again, it becomes a quarter Q1. Touch it against something that's neutral again, it becomes an eighth Q1, and so on. So he doesn't actually know what the value of Q1 is, but he does know what the value is from one trial relative to the next trial. 
So he doesn't actually have to have the, the real value, right? He just has to know, um, relatively speaking, how much he's changing it by. The force, how's he going to measure the force? You ever been on a swing set and, and, and like you twist the swing set around a dozen times? You ever do that? Everybody's done that, right? If you haven't, then you need to live a little bit and go out and, and uh, revisit your childhood because everybody, everybody's done that at some point, right? You guys know intuitively that the more you twist that swing, the more force it requires, right? The harder it is to twist it, right? You could measure that. One revolution would take this much force to twist it. Two revolutions would take more force. Three revolutions would take more force, and so on. You could figure out exactly how much force is required to twist it a certain amount. Well, that's what Kuan would have done here. He would have known how much force is required to twist this string a certain amount. So by measuring the amount that it twisted, he was able to get the value of the force. So he's got a real value for force. He's got a relative value for charge. And of course, distance, R, that's the easy one. How hard is it to measure the distance between Q1 and Q2? Use a ruler, right? The third and final experiment that he would have performed, what's he going to manipulate this time? What's he going to change this time? He's already changed Q1, he's changed Q2, what's he going to change this time? He wants to change the distance that separates them. We don't, we don't want to call it a radius because we're not referring to a circle, but just the separation distance, R. The responding variable would once again be force. How much did the string twist? The control variables in this case would be Who's got this one, the control variables? What's left? Q1 and Q2. So he plots this graph. This time it's R on the x-axis and force on the y-axis. This time he gets a bit of a different shape. Looks like this. An inverse relationship. As R goes up this time, F goes down. It's not a linear relationship. In fact, the relationship is not just an inverse relationship, it's an inverse square relationship. As R goes up, F goes down, but F will go down quicker than R goes up. F is related to the inverse of the square of the distance that separates them. So he takes his three little experiments here, and he combines them. He knows that F is related directly to Q1. He knows that F is related directly to Q2. He knows that F is related to the inverse of the square of the distance. But if you've ever done proportionalities or those things that are related to other things in math class, you know that you can't just make it equal to Q1, Q2 over R squared. When you replace this proportionality sign with an equal sign, you have to tack in a constant, K. It's just a number. Sometimes I call it a fudge factor. It's not equal to Q1, Q2 over R squared. Well, it's equal to something times that. A constant times that. The constant is just kind of a fudge factor to make it work, to make the equation work. So k, which is called Coulomb's constant, has a value of 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meters squared per Coulomb's squared. Wow. Oh. If you got a crazy number, if you think that's a crazy number, the units are even worse. The good news is that number is on your data sheet, so including the units, so you don't really have to remember those units. 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meters squared per coulomb squared. 
this law should look familiar. In physics 20, you did another law that had the same, the exact same structure. It was called Newton's law of universal gravitation. Remember Coulomb's law, the one we just looked at, k q1 q2 over r squared. Newton's law of universal gravitation from physics 20, big G m1 m2 over r squared. The force of electricity between two charges, the force of gravity between two masses. Well, let's compare those two equations, these two new, well, the one new equation that you've learned with the one old equation that you already knew. The relationship in both cases we call an inverse square relationship because the force is inversely related to the square of the distance. In other words, as R goes up, F goes down. And that should make sense to us, right? If, if you get two charges that are causing a force between each other, the further you pull them back from each other, the weaker the force is going to be. So the relationship is an inverse square relationship. The magnitude, the constant for Coulomb is 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. The gravitational constant was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. In almost every case, the electric force is bigger than the force of gravity. We think of gravity as being a big force because that's the one that we experience every day, right? You jump off of a ladder, what happens? You fall to the ground. It must be a big force because you fell to the ground, right? Well, no, it's not. Gravity is actually a pretty small force. The reason that you fell to the ground is because you're pretty big. If you were very, very light and the Earth was very, very light, the thing that was pulling you towards it, then it wouldn't be a very big force at all. Okay, relatively speaking, gravitational force is way weaker than the electric force. And we can tell that by simply looking at the constant. K times a bunch of numbers, G times a bunch of numbers. K is 10 to the 9, G is 10 to the minus 11. K is 10 to the 20 times bigger than G is. So the electric force will normally be quite a bit bigger than the gravitational force. Finally, direction. Well, here's one big difference here. A lot of similarities between these two forces, but the electrostatic force, the force of gravity is always attractive. Right? We know that um, one mass attracts another mass. If you were in my physics 20 class, we did the corny little demonstration where I said, pick a partner, look at your partner. Remember this, Daniel? Remember this? Pick a partner, and then you said, repeat after me. Remember that one? There was always that, that force of attraction. Between any two masses, there's a gravitational force of attraction. Between any two charges, there's a force of attraction or repulsion. So gravity, it always has to be attractive, whereas the electrostatic force, Coulomb's law, can be attractive or it can be repulsive. They can push each other apart. Got it? All right, that's it for today, guys.